Hello, my name is Matthew and I'm with the Tampa Hillsborough County Public Library. Welcome to African Americans in the West with Dr. Julian Chambliss. Hey, Dr. Chambliss, how are you doing today? I'm good, how are you? Good, good, and thank you very much for joining us. Uh, today is Monday, February 8th, 2021. This is one of our uh, National Black History uh, Awareness Month uh, events. Uh, if you go to hcplc.org slash Black History Month, you will see there are a number of other events coming up this week and beyond and we hope that you will join us for those. Um, so now uh, I'm actually gonna turn off my camera, turn off my microphone, officially welcome Dr. Chambliss and uh, start the presentation. All righty, uh, hopefully everyone can hear me. My name is Julian Chambliss. I am a professor of English with an appointment in history at Michigan State University. I'm happy to talk to you about African-Americans in the West. Uh, so. Typically, when people think about African Americans, they universally think about this as primarily a question of the South, right? And of course, that is not true. The reasons for that are obvious in, in this emphasis because of slavery and the experience of African Americans sort of defining um, that region in many ways in terms of social, economic, political transformations in the United States. But of course, there are African Americans in every part of the country. And I might hasten to add African Americans in every part of the world. But in the context of the American sort of narrative, the West is a place where African American participation is really sort of cut out in some very real way in our sort of national telling. But there are two forgotten stories of African Americans in the West that I want to call our attention to today in a hopes of sort of like reformatting our way of thinking about African American experience. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, that first sort of forgotten narrative is around Indian fighters and the Buffalo Soldiers. So we have a little clip that I'm gonna we're gonna show you uh, from a film from 1997. So Matthew, hit play for me. That clip is from a 1997 film starring Danny Glover called uh, Buffalo Soldiers. Now that, that is an important uh, film. This was a passion project for Danny Glover that really was at the time an attempt to rewrite at some level the sort of forgotten narrative of African-American uh, service in terms of the Buffalo Soldiers, which, you know, it's a testament to the fact that I think there's a broader public awareness of the contributions of African-American soldiers uh, in the post-Civil War era. But the other element here that's worth noting when we think about African-Americans in the West is the prominence and the centrality of, of forgotten communities created by African-Americans. And so when I think about this in the context of uh, African-American history, these stories of both the sort of cowboy narrative that in some ways is defined by cowboy and Indians and the, the struggles of the military and these questions of black communities that went west to create um, an opportunity for safety in the aftermath of the Civil War are important narratives that we, we tend to forget. For the most part, when we think about the United States in the post Civil War period, the 19th century period, it's important to recognize, of course, that within our national narrative, there are a lot of people who are foreign born. So the African Americans uh, who are in the West are also co-mingling with a number of people from other parts of the world that makes for a multicultural West. And this is important because a lot of the mythology we have about the United States um, tends to overlook, in fact, the, the great diversity and the cultural import that comes from these different people who are making the Western experience what it is. So we're often borrowing from the heritage of African-Americans, the heritage of Spanish influence in the West to create the context for the American West that we know. This is, I think, important because uh, in the context of the Buffalo Soldiers, this was really an immediate consequence of the aftermath of the Civil War. 1866 Act of Congress created the peacetime residence of all Black soldiers that we associate with the Buffalo soldiers uh, of, of that film from 1997. This was um, two infantry and two cavalry divisions. 
And these were all black soldiers, many of which had fought in the Civil War, but they're unable to, to work east of the Mississippi in part because white people don't want them. The Buffalo soldiers that we know are tasked with Indian fighting, right? Remember after the Civil War, this is the period of the Indian Wars of the 1870s and 1880s, part of that quote unquote civilizing transformation associated with uh, the spread of Americans and to the West and the selling of the Great Plains and the displacement of Native American people across the region. It fell to the Buffalo Soldiers to do much of that sort of signature fighting. And indeed the name Buffalo Soldier, which is a contested name, we don't know exactly where it came from, but the common mythology is that it was uh, a kind of respectful name attached by Native Americans who were fighting these African-American soldiers um, to sort of uh, denote their respect for them because they were naming them after a revered animal, the buffalo. These soldiers were involved in Indian fighting, but they were also involved in a number of other sort of military operations throughout the period. Uh, this map shows you the numerous conflicts that happened throughout uh, the West and the Upper West and the Midwest and, and Lower West. And again, African-American soldiers were key parts of that transformation. These soldiers were also involved in policing actions in many of the sort of like cattle wars and range wars that dominated the 1880s. It fell to Buffalo soldiers sometimes to mediate these conflicts between uh, sort of emerging industrialized cattle industry and uh, independent owners who were often in conflict over control of the system that was coming into place to create these sort of industrial industrial uh, food system that we know and love today. Uh, these conflicts often pitting hired mercenaries who had fought in the Civil War against each other on different sides gave rise to some of the conflicts that we associate with the legends of gunfights and struggles in the West. So very famously, someone like Billy the Kid was actually a hired gun in one of these range wars that were very common in this region. And it was actually Buffalo soldiers that were often employed to try to bring calm to the bloodshed that was being created by these struggles. These soldiers were in fact excellent horsemen, excellent uh, uh, sort of military people and revered for their bravery and really respected in a, in a manner that most African-Americans couldn't really achieve in normal walks of life. As I said, most of these soldiers wouldn't have been able to be uh, positioned in, the, in east of the Mississippi. So being so sort of stationed in the West, being respected, having the authority of being a soldier gave these African-Americans the opportunity to do something uh, that was well respected, but also at some level fairly compensated in a time where increasingly African-Americans found themselves cut out and marginalized in any sort of real professional context. So even in this context, when we look at um, these soldiers here, uh, they are being put in the position, it's worth noting, of being the one people who are um, positioned to work and police the Native American population. And one of the, 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 the struggles here, I think when we, we tell this story, is to recognize that both the African Americans who are soldiers who are fighting on the Native American populations like the Sioux and the Lakota, and those Native Americans themselves are both caught up in a system that marginalizes them and marginalizes their humanity. But nonetheless, in the context of the possibilities open to African-Americans, these soldiers were incredibly uh, courageous, winning medals of honor and being respected within the military for their ability. Eventually, of course, this unit will further submit its reputation by fighting outside the West, uh, having meaningful engagements in Cuba as well under um, Theodore Roosevelt in the Battle of San Juan Hill. So this is a, an example of sort of contribution of African-Americans in the military that frames the West, but it's often hit, hidden, but they're important sort of stabilizing force in that quote unquote narrative of civilization that emerges after the Civil War in terms of Western expansion. 
The other element here, of course, is the general placement of the black cowboy, right? The Buffalo soldier is something that we, we sort of think about in terms of like a normalization of african Americanness, But the question of the, the black cowboy is one that is also important to recognize. Uh, this great quote from William um, Katz is great because he points out, again, for African Americans, their opportunities are limited. And being a black cowboy was actually a great opportunity for many people. So what is a black cowboy and how they fit into the story of the West? Well, again, this is a consequence of the post-Civil War period. Actually, about a quarter of all cowboys in the West were Black. And in many cases, this makes perfect sense when we think about the spread of slavery in the period leading up to the Civil War. A perfect example is a place like Texas. As Americans moved into that was then Spanish territory, they brought slaves with them to manage the land and create uh, the large plantations and uh, farms that we understand as part of their civilizing effort. Many of the slaves gained skills associated with tending cattle. They did so, however, as slaves. In the aftermath of the war, most of these white, most of these white landowners that were brought back after the Civil War were forced to hire these slaves as cowhands. And the skills they picked up, tending cattle, uh, riding a range, branding, all these things, often which they, they picked up with co-mingling with the Mexican cowboys became uh, crucial to, again, that emerging cattle industry of the post-Civil War era. Uh, and again, as I say, this is a co-mingling process. That multicultural West was really dominated by a longer history and narrative of the influence of the Spanish and the skills that they brought over, they really define what we understand to be the cowboy. So these are really skills gleaned from a longer tradition in Mexico and other Spanish controlled territory that African Americans get trained in. So that experience that they gain as slaves, they put the put the put the use in uh, that emerging cattle industry. These stories get romanticized and whitened in popular culture, but there's no question that black cowboys were some of the most skilled cowboys in this period. For instance, Nat Love, who was a former slave, as many of these, these cowboys in this era was, this is the, the, the man who's actually the basis for the fictional character of Dead Eye Dick. Love worked as a, a cowboy and worked across the Southwest and in Mexico and won numerous cowboy contests and that's where he garnered the, the nickname that Wood Dick. But in the stories that were written about him, he was turned white and his contributions and his superiority as a, a cow, a cow hand and cowboy was sort of erased from the landscape. And so this is a cover of one of those stories that features a, a dead Wood Dick. The other element here that is always important to recognize is that yes, you have the soldier, the black soldier, very important to provide stability. You have the black cowboy, very skilled in the emerging cattle industry that's so important to the industrializing West. But you also have black communities. And the aftermath of the Civil War, and in particular at the end of Reconstruction, hundreds of thousands of African Americans leave the South and they go West. Um, and this is a great picture from uh, the Library of Congress showing some African Americans on the move from Louisiana and Mississippi. One of the first things that these, these communities do is that they create, these white people do is they create communities. Uh, Pap Singleton and his partner helped set up the Edgefield Real Estate and Homestead Association in Tennessee. And they organized the mass movement of a large number of African Americans to Kansas to create the town of Nicodemus. Nicodemus is one of the first black communities created in the West. And here you can see a town site plan that sort of lays out what it, what it looked like. Uh, and it persisted until the early part of, of the, the 1950s. This picture for 1953 to give you a sense of what it, what, what it sort of devolved into. Today, Nicodemus is actually a national park site but it gives you a sense of the 
the kind of mass exodus that we can associate with with the West. Another sort of almost forgotten element here in terms of community building is the black towns of Oklahoma. This is a really poor map, but it does give you a sense that each one of these is an example of a black town. At the time that this was happening in the 1880s, 1870s, 1880s, of course, Oklahoma was Indian territory. But at the time, there were a number of promoters of black townships that actually flowed to the idea that Oklahoma would be, become a black state and that these communities that were being set up there would be um, positioned to give African-Americans uh, freedom and opportunities that they were quickly losing in this sort of normalized Eastern part of the United States. And so the communities that were set up really ran the gamut. Uh, places like Langston City, uh, which still persists today it has a, a great African-American college there, were deliberately designed to be sort of African-American havens. Each one of these towns provided um, some support, economic activity, educational activity that were so important for African-Americans seeking to get away from the rising racism they associated with uh, the West. And here you have the, the, the main college building in Langston. And Langston College is still a college to this very day. So if you, if you go to Oklahoma, you can visit Langston College. Bowley, Oklahoma was actually one of the most successful African-American communities in the history of, in, this, in this period was celebrated by uh, Booker T. Washington as an economic hub for African-Americans. And it served as a, uh, a sort of destination for a number of African-Americans in, in this period. Many of them were working agriculture. Uh, it too had educational hub, the college there. And this was a majority black town with a bank, school, businesses, so on and so forth. Again, celebrated and recognized by Booker T. Washington as an example of what African-Americans could achieve if they were given the opportunity. Uh, this is another one of the black communities in, in Oklahoma, uh, Tallahoushee. Tallahoushee is a Indian black community. And some of these communities did sort of balance out being having African-Americans and Native Americans in the space. And that's an important part of this story. The Oklahoma story in particular is a counterpoint to the conflict that defined the Buffalo soldier and their engagement with Native Americans. Here in the Oklahoma context, even though this was Indian territory, you did see the emergence of communities where African-Americans and Native Americans worked together. Uh, places like Redbird, people like Tutahali were very successful for African-Americans but African-Americans also partner with Native Americans in some of these spaces. So my, my goal here was to try to sort of give us a, a sense of like the, the broader picture of the complicated narratives being offered uh, for African-Americans in the West. And indeed, I think it's important to recognize that these two, two narratives, the soldier, the cowboy, the communities, really represent a way that African-Americans were responding to uh, the problems caused by being African-American, especially in the post-Civil War period. And I think one of the things that these stories sort of hint at is their ability to adapt to these dynamic situations and try to forge a new sense of community. So I'm gonna leave it right there and hopefully I can uh, uh, address any questions you might have. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Chambliss. And uh, as the questions start to come in, um, I just wanna remind everybody that you can post your questions and comments in the question section. We do have some time to go through all of them. Um, and while we're, uh, we got a couple coming in, but let me uh, share one more thing here. The uh, book and video shout out for today is The African Americans, Many Rivers to Cross, which, uh, the book by Henry Louis Gates Jr. can be found at hcplc.org slash books. And the same Henry Louis Gates Jr. was involved in the film project series that you can find on Hoopla and Canopy, both as streaming video. As you may know, Hoopla and Canopy does limit you the number of checkouts that you have per month. And so if you're all filled up on one platform, you can jump over to the other to check out this series. And I'll also mention this sort of like a little bonus one since you mentioned Nat Love, 
in your talk, uh, Dr. Chambliss, we do have several books on Nat Love um, that are, you know, feature feature him and his skills and his history, um, and including um, a couple, I believe, that are specifically for kids. And so, if, if oh, you're awesome. interested in introducing any, um, you know, children uh, to this topic or to Nat Love in particular, we do have at least one or two titles in the collection uh, on him. So uh, now I'll stop showing my screen again so that we can go into our Q&A. Uh, I'll ask the first question, which is um, something, I think that they're wanting you to expand on something you touched on, uh, which is uh, discussing Buffalo soldiers and their relationship to uh, having been slaves or newly arrived slaves that were on plantations. I, I, how was that transition occurring? Was it sort of a back and forth thing over time? Um, you know, what was the relationship well, there between um, right. uh, so, slaves who had arrived and, and becoming Buffalo soldiers? Right, so many of the soldiers who are uh, in the 9th and 10th Cavalry were uh, soldiers in the Civil War. So remember that within the timeline of the war, initially African-Americans were able to serve and once they were able to serve, they actually created uh, two regiments that were uh, black former slaves, for the most part, former slaves, and but not always, right? Like remember Glory, right? Remember that film Glory from the people from Massachusetts? Many of those people were never slaves. They were they were free black people. Uh, but in in some of these cases, yes, they were former slaves. And of course, the, the coming of the, the Union Army does, by default, create freedom for slaves. Although it's always important to recognize the legal standing around freedom and slaves and during the Civil War was always very hazy. Um, so yes, these were, at the time, former slaves who joined the Army and um, served in the Army. After the war was over, those units were reconstituted, right? You had that after 1866, and like they re they reorganized and created two two units of infantry, two units of cavalry, and positioned those people again west of the Mississippi because they were black, and most communities did not want armed black people. Most white communities did not want armed black people in in those communities. And that was part of the reason why Buffalo Soldiers almost exclusively were in the west. Uh, in terms of where they operated, right? They were in the part of the country that was not yet at some level um, civilized, right? It's important to recognize that this period from roughly 1866 to roughly 1890 is a period of um, building out of infrastructure, right? This is, remember the, the railroad, the Continental Railroad, it's not, not connected till 1877, right? Like, so it's in many ways, there are a lot of communities that are tiny, they're primary agrarian communities, they're primary isolated. They're dependent on the military to provide um, command and control, right? You do have the conflict with Native Americans, but you do also have, as I alluded to, some basic conflicts around the establishment of like a kind of industrial order. So then when we talk about the industrializing West, some of the conflict there is with corporations that are doing things like mining, they're doing things like cattle, that are displacing what had been up until that point, small land holding operations, but they're being consolidated in, to create the kind of infrastructure that we associate with the 20th century the kind of massive industrial corporate infrastructure. And that does lead to conflict. So the range wars that I was alluding to are really conflicts between small landowners and larger landowners who are corporatizing. Like you think about the big, if you've seen any Western, you think about the big landowner who is bringing order and structure to his, his cattle by fencing it off, right? But prior to that, what the West was was primarily free range, open range, right? There were no fences. And so people would allow their cattle to sort of wander over what was essentially at that time, federal land. But as land gets parsed out, bought and, and organized, 
the conflicts that you see emerge are between um, sort of like warring factions. And, and it's the army that often has to come in and 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 put these range wars down, right? Like these, these conflict between these sort of bigger concerns and minor concerns and the people they're employing for security around their property, their cattle. And so Native Americans are a part of that story for, for Buffalo soldiers are fighting them as they're being pushed out and, and white people are taking over their land and being put on reservations and they're resisting that. Native uh, Buffalo soldiers are a part of that fight. But then once they're gone, Buffalo soldiers get caught up in trying to stabilize that emerging corporate order. So to answer the original part of the question, they were soldiers before the war, right? They joined up to help to help fight in the war. They stayed on and then got caught up in that kind of what, what historians like to refer to as the modernization of the West, that industrialization and transformation in the in that that happens in that sort of 20 year period immediately after the war. And part of the reason some of these conflicts are so vicious, as I alluded to, is that many of the people who are fighting in the West, those hired guns, those mercenaries, those security people, they have fought in the war. So like they were Southerners and Northerners who had fought not that long ago on a battlefield and now they're employed in these sort of like economic conflicts and that part of the reason why they have the uh, the sort of viciousness that you do see in some of these some of these stories um that i think we got like a answer to a lot of questions there uh, as i'm scrolling through which is really really terrific but it is it is i just want to say like that's pretty interesting because that dynamic of um there being sort of different levels of freedom and the question of legality and and freedom especially because it, some of it was pre-emancipation so right, I mean, that's, yeah. that's, and then all of a sudden, you know, they're being employed to deal with property lines, and it's just, it's a, it's a pretty, pretty wild time, uh, uh, you know, to be right. going well, through that and, kind of transformation. Yeah, I mean, I would like to point out, like, you know, when we talk about um, freeing the slaves, you know, the Emancipation Proclamation doesn't really free any slaves, right? Uh, most slaves that that get caught up uh, behind Union lines are classified very early on as contraband. Right, you know, uh, very famously, they were, you know, Benjamin Butler classified slaves that come across the Union lines contraband. So because he didn't want to give them back, because suddenly it's like that's our property, you have to give it back, right? Like you know, like no, you don't make the contraband. Uh, but then once the 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 restriction on black people serving in the army is lifted, you see a massive amount of African Americans join, and of course. Even in the field, you saw African Americans who were former slaves act as scouts, uh, provide, you know, leading the Union Army into the places that they were enslaved to to help reunite with their families and help end the war. I mean, their famous Harriet Tugman was a uh, very well known Union scout, right? You know, the woman who had snuck in and tried to snatch people away. So, um, in the aftermath of that, serving in the Union Army for African Americans. Uh, it provides a monicum of freedom in a space that still is very hostile to Black people, right? Uh, remember that many places in the upper Midwest legally barred Black people from entering uh, prior to the Civil War. Like you couldn't, you couldn't live in Illinois, for instance, right? So there's a lot of um, really contested ideology around Black people and their citizenship. And at some level, Buffalo soldiers were conducting themselves as high level citizens, right? They're, they, are, they are serving and protecting, they are, are part of the kind of civil order that is helping to transform the West. But it is definitely a, a complicated place for a person of African descent in the United States to be in. And I don't want to oversimplify that, uh, that reality, right? Like they're serving um, in a in, for a government that at the time is doing some very concrete things in the context of the moment to give them citizenship, but these but African Americans really feel they have to like seize on that citizenship, right? They they really have to push to make that real, which is one of the reasons why I think you see a lot of Black people making communities in the West. 
And uh, you mentioned during during that answer the the idea of getting back to families. We have a question here. Um, were African Americans in the West primarily single when they're on these sort of assignments or taking jobs or, or signing up? Um, or did they have families that they were trying to get back to in other parts of the country? Right, one of the things about this period is that you do have a lot of uh, what we call economic migrants, which is very common for, for people of color. A lot of the foreign born people on that map are economic migrants, meaning like they have come to the United States. They have gone West because of the opportunity in something like mining, in something like cattle, and, and they have family someplace else. In the case of African-Americans, a large number of African-Americans in the immediate aftermath of the war go searching for family that was lost. So there's actually a great project um, called Last Seen, where you can see all the newspaper um, notices that Black people put in the newspapers because they only could go by the last time I saw this person. So you, you'll you see these newspaper ads where Black people say, I'm looking for my son, I'm looking for my wife, I'm looking for my kid. They were last seen here, blah, 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 blah. If you know of them or know where their whereabouts, email me or, or text or wire me, blah, blah, blah. And uh, that was hundreds upon hundreds of African-Americans in the aftermath of the Civil War. And that goes on for really for for years, right? Like African Americans seeking seeking their their, their loved ones, um, trying to reclaim um, families that were lost, children were lost, spouses that were lost. At the same time, you do have African American families that are making the decision to go west, right? So, uh, for African Americans on plantations in places like Georgia, Alabama, Florida, um, Mississippi, Texas, a lot of those people. Uh, especially after 1877 when Reconstruction is over, they make the the jump to like, we're going to go west. That's They go to places like Kansas, they go to places like Oklahoma, but they also go to places like California, and they're going as a family. Um, often they're leaving uh, economically uh, un disadvantaging situations, like so a lot of African Americans in the, in the aftermath of the war get involved in really complicated um, um, leasing contracts with with white landowners or they're um working the land as as um sort of like debtors and things like that um the, the actual term is escaping me right now um i should know this term i haven't thought about this in a while but so basically while they are tied to the land as either they're leasing the land or they're, they're debtors on the land and they have to work it to, to to try to pay off their debt. There is plenty of evidence that African Americans like screw it and like they pack up and leave overnight and like they hit the road and they just go west. They go to places like Kansas. They go to places like Oklahoma. They go far Arizona, uh, California. Um, we don't talk as much about that story. We talk a lot more about people who are like basically trapped on the land year to year. But there is plenty of evidence that Black people just leave and they leave as a family especially in the 1880s and 1890s when things get really bad. So it's a mix, right? You do have um, men in particular who will strike out and, and look for those jobs, um, often physically demanding jobs in the West, doing things like mining, doing cattle and things like that. But you also have families that travel looking for a better life. Um, so we had, a, um, speaking of 1890s, I, we have another question here from, from our audience, but before you do, one of our backup moderators volunteered a term that maybe was what you were thinking of. Is it share, share farming? Sharecropping, yeah, that's right. Sharecropping, share cropping, right. Yeah. Sharecropping is like you work the land, it's owned by somebody else, right? and you and you get a share, and they sell the land because you ring it, like, it, yeah. It's sharecropping, and then okay. it's lease, and then there's there's leasing. Like white people do lease land, where they have to grow crops and so on and so forth. Right. Sharecropping, and which becomes very difficult uh, with the collapse of cotton and the boll weevil epidemic, uh, especially in the 1890s, right? So this is why you see a large number of African Americans leave the land in the South, and they go to the city, and they also go west. So they have like a series, there's drought, there's a bull weevil infection, and the price of cotton tanks all within like a kind of 10 year period. And they're like, we're out. 
uh, if they can, right? If they, right. Can. If they can, if they, if yeah, if they can find another way. Right. Um, and and so this is, um, I want to say somebody has a very specific thing they want you to talk about, which is um, talking about the 1890s uh, related to land settlements and the relationship of the events in Tulsa in in early 1920s or 1921. Right. So the the Tulsa um, the Tulsa massacre or riot, which is uh, this was a very prosperous. See, there's one of the the, the sort of um, complications around uh, African American community building is that you see these really successful economically successful African American communities like Bowley, which most people don't know Bowley today. But Bowley was very famous to African Americans in like 1912, right? It was like this really famous place where African Americans were. It did show up in a history book because Bowley was one of the banks that Dillinger robbed. You remember John Dillinger, like the guy was robbing banks. He robbed the bank in Bowley, right? So that tells you they had money. If Dillinger robbed it, you know, like he, he was not a person who did not rob a bank with money. Uh, but that was a, a community, as a lot of these communities, that was prim not primarily African American. Tulsa, this was an example of a very wealthy Black district uh, called Greenwood. This was an incredibly successful uh, community that was really the economic heart uh, at the time of that community, right? Um, these people had tremendous economic uh, power. And this, of course, is often seen as the reason for uh, the sort of accusation. And the pattern here is the pattern you find in a lot of these cases, an accusation of a white woman being assaulted leads to um, a race riot and the destruction of black property. There are horrific pictures of the destruction of, of that community. It's, it's this, this year, this last year, I mean, this year is the anniversary, right? Like, so this is the anniversary of the, the Tulsa, Tulsa massacre. Uh, and there's actually a, a number of books that, that are either just come out or about to come out about it. It's important to recognize that they did rebuild that community, right? So um, it was burned to the ground. There were many people murdered. Um, there was There's a great commission report on the massacre that you can read. John Hope Franklin was one of the historians that worked on it. It was a very famous African-American historian, one of the people that worked on it. And there are actually photographs, like you can see the sort of horrific things they did. They hung African-Americans from bridges. They they burned down their property. Um, there's, there's a great documentary on this called Banished, which is about sort of like racial, black racial cleansing. Uh, that's how the filmmaker describes it. And I think that's an accurate description. There are a number of communities where black people were attacked, their property was destroyed. And in most cases, those black people don't have the wherewithal to come back. And so the property gets sold to white people dirt cheap and it becomes the basis for their, their wealth and prosperity and, and the loss of African-American property. But in the case of Tulsa, it's important to recognize, yeah, they burned that stuff to the ground. Yes, they murdered those people, but they were still in some ways very well off and many of those people stayed and they rebuilt, right? They stayed and they rebuilt. And part of the reason that they even had an investigation was because of the the, the strength of that community uh, holding people accountable, you know, decades later uh, related to that. But uh, this that gives you a sense of that's a district within a white community versus some of these all black communities that were created around the same time. Uh, it's the same difference in the Florida context of a place like Eatonville, which was created around the same time. A lot of these towns, the towns were created in the 1890s, like eight, late 1880s, early 1890s. Uh, and Eatonville was like one of the first incorporated municipalities that was created by black people ever. Uh, but right down the road, like literally two miles down the road, there was a really prosperous economic center that was African American called Hannibal, Squ called Hannibal Square, which was actually built on a community called Lakeview that had been there before. And when they incorporated the town and went apart, they incorporated a black town. So Hannibal Square was 
a, a, a prosperous African-American business district within Winter Park, which now if you people think of Winter Park and they're in Florida, they're like, oh, really? Like, yeah. Like they were in their own property and they were very well well off. So it was, it, there's a kind of weird analog to that. The, you know, Julian, even though you have left us here in Florida, my my secret goal is that somehow you would talk about Florida, even though you're no longer here. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, I got to check that box, you know, on my own, <laughs> on my own personal list. It's perfect. Um, well, listen, this is what we're going to do. We're going to go just for a couple more minutes and answer like one, maybe two more questions. But before we do, let me make sure for any of those of you who have to, have to get going, uh, let me go ahead and share um, our contact information. Uh, we're going to answer one or two more questions, but you can reach the library at 813-273-3652 or go to our contact page, uh, hcplc.org slash contact. Also on our website, we have other upcoming events, including a number of other uh, events for Black History Month, but we're planning well into the summer and even beyond that now. So uh, we have a lot coming up uh, for all ages, so please do check that out. And to uh, get in, uh, find out a little bit more about Dr. Chambliss, you can go to julianchambliss.com. Um, and I don't know, I'm assuming your social media is up on that website as well, uh, Julian. I know you're right, yeah. Um And so uh, please uh, check that out. We'll answer just a couple of more questions and let you know too that if you have not been paying attention to the chat, a couple of the things that um, Dr. Chambliss mentioned, the last scene uh, project as well as the uh, Tulsa 2021 um, anniversary. Oh. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, He's I got it in there already. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, those links are in the chat. You can click on them now while we're still in session, and then navigate right back to to us while we're wrapping up over the next few minutes. Um, and then also to to let you know that um, uh, in addition to uh, the towns you mentioned, Eaton Mill and Winter Park, um, there is a, a somewhat similar uh, the massacre of Okoe happened in right. uh, a little over 100 years ago. The the um, anniversary of that event um, was last year. Last and the year, County right. Regional History Center where Okoe is located, they did a lot on that. And I know they have some things on their website. So if you're interested in Florida, you know, significant events of this kind, you may want to and check out the Orange County Regional History Center. They have a little bit on the Okoe massacre. Um, yeah, and an equal it, justice initiative. Um, which is uh, EJI. They that have, Brian Stevenson is involved with that? Brian Stevenson, right. They have a, a report on racial violence where they, that you can download as like a PDF where you can sort of read up on, on um, some, some, some sort of true histories. And also with the Okoye riot, I think it was Channel 6, they did a great documentary on Okoye oh, yeah. that, that you can stream. Um, I think it was Channel 6. Uh, and so, yeah, if you're if you're interested, um, there were a number of and banished is the name of the documentary about um, this sort of displacing African Americans uh, through violence, and that's that's a documentary that you can find on on PBS. Uh, I think it's an independent lens. I'll drop it in the chat. Um, and that's a great documentary. I I don't know if it's in Canopy or Hoopla. All right, but, I will uh, I'll repaste that into the chat as well, so everybody can see. Um, let's see, just two more quick questions here. Uh, one is: Were African Americans allowed to participate in government homestead programs? They were. There was actually an, a, a kind of Southern homestead program that gave African-Americans land. Uh, it was actually, you know, going back to Matthew's point, it was probably the most successful, that program, in Florida. Because most of the other places where they were given uh, land, and this was government land in the South, it was really poor land. But in the case of Florida, they had the highest level of success in terms of like imparting land to African-Americans. So the Southern Homestead Act made land available to um, former slaves in uh, certain parts of the former Confederacy. And that was a way for African-Americans to get a hold of land, except in most cases, most historians would argue that the land that they got wasn't that great. Uh, but it, it did happen. The Southern Homestead Act did, did do that. Okay, great. Um, 
last question. I'll share one more comment from the audience and then we'll then we'll say goodbye because I think we could probably press you for more information for a few more hours, but uh, yes. I know I know you got places to be. So um, one of them was uh, about, um, oh, the skill, you mentioned during your main talk about the skills of uh, both uh, white and, and black Americans could participate in kind of show off their skills. Nice. Um, and so um, in the spirit of this, uh, you know, of your talk here, African Americans in the West, what were some of the skills that were being judged and, and what did that mean? Uh, you know, what kind of weight did that carry? Right. So uh, the contests that I'm talking about are, are rodeo contests, right? So it's like bulldogging. Bulldogging, which is a technique of, of sort of like chasing down and, and uh, restraining cattle, was invented by a black person. So like bull, you know, right, riding a horse and roping it and like that, that was invented by a black person, bulldog. Uh, the the in fact the cowboy who did it became a, a movie cowboy right um, Bill Pickens right and so uh, what we understand to be cowboy contests or skill contests are related to things that they needed to do to be cowboys so roping you know using a rope riding a horse fast and accurate and accurately right like because when you're on the range and you're um, managing cattle. What you gotta do is you gotta like ride alongside the cattle, but you also gotta like move the cattle, right? So it's really a kind of like, um, you gotta be agile and you gotta be one with the horse. Like if, you, if you're if a horse person, you understand that riding a horse isn't just simply an exercise of pointing. You know, it's, 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 a, it's a complicated balancing act from what you, you know, you read about it. I'm like, okay, like, you know, it's, it's you, 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 you have a relationship and you need to be able to, to, if you're doing this out in the weather with another animal, you know, it gets even more complicated, right? So using a gun, um, using a rope, using a horse, this is the kind of things that they were doing and in these cowboy contests. And even today, if you see um, sort of professional cowboy circuit and it still exists, that's the stuff that they were doing. That's the stuff they were doing, breaking cattle, um, riding things, roping things, shooting things. That's the stuff that they were doing. And that's the stuff that, that Nate Love won, you know, the equivalent to like the gold medal for. It, that's funny you say that because it's so it's down to like sort of like a sport with all these different factions, you know, <laughs> yeah, that right. you have to get really good at in, in order to compete. Right. Um, well, I'm just going to read one more quick comment here, uh, which is, uh, somebody writes in many thanks for an interesting and informative presentation. Oh, I think okay. that's that's even an understatement. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this is this is really really great. Thank you, Dr. Chambliss. We really appreciate you uh, joining us with the library and talking about this uh, this subject. And we'll hopefully have you back sometime. Yeah, and if you're interested in knowing more, there's great uh, pieces in the Smithsonian Magazine on Black Cowboys, and of course the National. Um, Library of Congress has uh, a number of like online installations uh, that track African Americans, and they often have a lot of content that's available. So definitely check it out. I don't, I don't claim to be an expert on African Americans in the West, but uh, there are plenty of people who've done some great work, especially on the cowboy and some of the communities uh, that were created in the West, which we really don't know the full scope of all that they did in, a, in that pivot, pivotal period from the 1870s to the, uh, the turn of the century. Yeah, a lot of that's been forgotten or was neglected or or right. re, re, uh, reappropriated. Yeah, uh, just erased, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, thank you so much again. And everybody, have a good night. Thank you very much for joining us. And uh, we'll see you again soon, hopefully. Good Bye. night.